Lord, my daughter is even now dead. But come, lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This year, my dear faithful, today's gospel falls on a most opportune occasion, the first Sunday of November, the month of the holy souls in purgatory. The raising from the dead of the daughter of Jairus, which is recounted in today's gospel, is likewise a beautiful reminder to us of one of the great consolations of our holy faith, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. The miracle worked by our blessed Lord today is one of the many proofs of his divinity. For a miracle can only be worked by the power of God, and thus is a divine testimony in support of him who works the miracle. Thus it is that St. Paul declares that without the resurrection of our Lord, his greatest miracle, our faith would be in vain. For our Lord's rising glorious from the tomb is the greatest proof of his divine power, the greatest proof that all those things which he declares are the truth. We see in today's gospel the great faith of the poor man who has just lost his daughter. So confident is he that he approaches our blessed Lord and declares, Lord, my daughter is even now dead. But come, lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. This must be a reminder to us of the necessity of faith in our own future resurrection. For the recollection of eternity is a most effective means both of deterring us from committing sin and also of inspiring us to practice virtue. Were it not for the most consoling and salutary doctrine of purgatory, however, the thought of eternity might easily lead us to despair. For we know both by reason and by faith that nothing which is imperfect Nothing which is tainted by sin, nothing which is displeasing to Almighty God, might ever enter heaven. The saints insist that so clearly does the soul see the wickedness of sin at one's particular judgment, that the soul would willingly cast itself into hell for all eternity, rather than stand before the majesty of God, its offended creator, bearing even the slightest stain of sin. Here we see the infinite mercy of God manifested. God does not desire that his creatures should be placed among the reprobate, and thus in his mercy he has created purgatory for the sake of those who, while possessing sanctifying grace, are not yet so perfect that they might enter heaven. Many souls must pass time in purgatory, for even among the few who preserve the state of sanctifying grace until the end, even fewer reach that perfection to which they are called. Who, in particular, shall go to purgatory? First, all those who die with any unforgiven venial sins on their souls. Those who have committed venial sins indeed retain the friendship of God. They still possess sanctifying grace, but their charity is weakened by each offense against Almighty God. Each sin that we commit, 
even the slightest, is to prefer some other thing over God. And no one who does not love God above all things might enter heaven. Here we see the value of frequent confession, of the fervent reception of Holy Communion, of the pious reception of extreme unction, and the importance of perfect contrition. For all of these things are means by which we might overcome any venial sins which dim the ardor of our charity. Second, all those go to purgatory who, even though they die without any stain of sin on their souls, have not made sufficient reparation for their past sins that have already been forgiven. This might be, for example, the case of someone who makes a good confession on his deathbed, but who has not time to make reparation before he is called to judgment. Yes, when we make a good confession, all those sins burdening our soul are forgiven, but it yet remains for us to satisfy God's justice by making reparation for sin. For this enables us both to demonstrate that our contrition for sin is genuine, while it also offers some recompense to the divine majesty for the offenses our sins have caused. This is the purpose of that penance which our confessor assigns us whenever we go to confession. And it is also one of the purposes which Holy Mother Church has in view by prescribing fasting and abstinence on various occasions throughout the year. This too, Holy Mother Church has in view when she grants indulgences by which we might obtain the remittance of the whole or at least a part of the temporal punishment due to our sins. It is a most salutary thought to consider purgatory in conjunction with the state of our own soul today. The thought of purgatory should help us to see the malice even of a venial sin, for the pains of purgatory are what God's justice demands for even an offense which we ourselves might consider trifling. The thought of purgatory should fill us with zeal in undertaking those means of making reparation for sin which are available to us, namely fasting, by which we mean any measures of mortification which we impose upon our lower nature. Prayer, which must be a central part of our daily lives, not an afterthought. Almsgiving, by which we atone particularly for sins of worldliness, of envy, of avarice, or theft. And finally, through the gaining of indulgences. The thought of purgatory should also serve as an incentive to virtue, that by attaining to perfection here on earth, we might be found worthy to immediately be admitted to the eternal joys of heaven without having to pass through purgatory. The thought of purgatory should also inspire us with pity and compassion for those poor souls who are detained there. They wish for nothing but to enjoy the beatific vision of God. But the one thing that they desire is kept from them until they should be purified. And this, more so even than the fires of purgatory, 
is the cause of the greatest anguish for the souls detained there. When we contemplate the infinite justice of God and our many sins, we must realize that it is very likely that each one of us shall one day be among those poor souls in purgatory. Let us, therefore, employ the same diligence and charity in assisting them as we hope others shall one day employ in assisting us. Remember that the prayers of the saints are most efficacious in the sight of God because of their great holiness. What better might we do than rely upon the gratitude of those souls unable to help themselves, whom we have assisted to obtain that which they long for most of all, the eternal happiness of heaven. They shall never rest until we ourselves join them in sharing that everlasting beatitude. Devotion to the holy souls in purgatory, diligence in assisting them to be released from their sufferings is one of the surest means of avoiding purgatory ourselves. Let us, therefore, particularly during this month dedicated to the holy souls, hasten to their aid so that we might here on earth diminish or overcome entirely any debt to the divine justice which we ourselves must yet pay so as to avoid purgatory and at our judgment to be numbered immediately among the saints. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.